Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 667 of the podcast and it is Friday the 6th of January 2023 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking to Ros Morris about how to finally finish your book this year. In the survey I did last autumn, one of the most common challenges for writers was actually finishing a book. So we go through all the things that might be stopping you and how to overcome them. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, well, very excitingly, now you can use Spotify promotion codes through Findaway Voices to give away copies of your audiobooks on Spotify. Now you get 100 codes per book and uh, I'll link to the blog in the show notes. But basically, if you already publish your audiobooks through Findaway Voices, you can go to your book, go to the, the um, uh, specific tab and it will give you 100 codes per book. Now, why do we give away free books? <laughs> Well, we want to encourage people to try our audiobooks through a new platform. And of course, Spotify is new for audiobooks. And to encourage you to try some of my books, I have some codes to give away. For two of my books, I've picked two, Your Author Business Plan, which might be useful for the new year, and also Map of Shadows, the first in my Map Walker Dark Fantasy Trilogy. So if you'd like a free promo code for one of these audiobooks on Spotify, please email me joanna at thecreativepen.com and I'll say before the end of January 2023 and I'll send you one if I haven't run out of codes. So most of my audiobooks are now on Spotify through Findaway Voices and of course I use and recommend Findaway Voices for wide distribution of audiobooks as it brings in many more streams of income. And of course, in terms of income, if one of your goals is making more money from your books in 2023, you might be interested in Rachel Heron's How Do You Write podcast, episode 339, where Rachel shares her money episode reviewing her 2022 author business. Now, if you don't know Rachel, she's a hybrid author with both traditional and indie published books. She's been on this show. Uh, before and the, her show is fantastic and she also has multiple streams of income from teaching writing and online courses as well as book sales so it's an interesting show and, and Rachel also writes fiction and non-fiction and memoir so she really covers everything she also recommended a book called Happy Money by Ken Honda and uh, Sasha Black also recommended that I'm listening to that on audio right now since I always enjoy a money mindset book <laughs> so uh, yeah that's Happy Money by Ken Honda and I also thought about reframing advertising as happy ads so uh, I'm going to try and change my attitude this year <laughs> Enjoy and have this more happy, appreciative attitude towards the abundance that we have. And uh, I, I mean, I'm just the same as you guys. I mean, I get overwhelmed with the number of possibilities we can possibly do with our books. Um, but yes, I, I feel like uh, it's a good mindset book. So Happy Money by Ken Honda and How Do You Write podcast with Rachel Heron. Now, another person to follow is Christine Catherine Rush, who is definitely one of my mentors for many years now. She has a blog at chriswrites.com and that's K-R-I-S writes.com. And Chris is doing a series of reflections on 2022, lots of different ones, tackling different aspects of the industry from traditional publishing to the current state of indie authors to social media and advertising And there are so many gems in the articles, all of which are pretty long, along with hints as to what might come in the year ahead. So part five in this series was about Amazon, and again, links in the show notes, and notes the layoffs that have been in the news again this week, with people being laid off in the Kindle devices area, as well as many others. And I'll link to a news item in the BBC. It's interesting they're laying off in the Kindle devices area, considering that Kindle Scribe is only just released, although I see it's already on sale. (laughs) 
<laughs> so <laughs> while I thought it was uh, too expensive before Christmas, I might actually get one now. <laughs> so Amazon also closed down their Kindle for periodicals, which has impacted many journals and online magazines, especially those not offered the option of joining Kindle Unlimited. Also of note is something I mentioned last year, which was the incorporation of music into Amazon Prime as a benefit. And Chris echoes a question about whether the same might happen to KU Books. And she also says how much the 20 Books Vegas conference, which uh, she goes to or speaks at with her uh, husband and business partner, Dean Wesley Smith, um, 20 Books Vegas now emphasises going wide when in years past it has been focused primarily on Amazon and KU. So Chris finishes this particular article by saying, as writer business people, you need to ask yourself, how would you do if your Amazon revenue vanished? What kind of changes would you have to make? This is no longer theoretical for many magazine publishers. It might not be theoretical for book publishers in the future either. Be prepared. In 2023, go wide. Expand your revenue base. And of course, going wide, I just mentioned audiobooks there. You can go wide with audio, with print, with ebooks. You don't have to do it all at once. You can do it with different series. So yeah, make it part of your plan going forward. Now, if you'd like to hear more about writing with PseudoWrite, and uh, I'm now going to include AI in the current stuff. I'm not even going to talk about it as futurist anymore because it is right now. If you'd like to hear more about writing with PseudoWrite as an AI co-pilot, check out Mark Leslie Lefebvre's discussion with Elizabeth Ann West on the Stark Reflections podcast, episode 284. That's Stark Reflections. And uh, you or you can probably just search pseudo right, S-U-D-O right. And uh, that's a really interesting uh, episode, even though I've been using it for ages, I listen to it and it absolutely reflects much of my experience. Although I do not generate finished words with pseudo right at the moment. I use it more as an extensive thesaurus for writing sensory detail and expanding what I have. But have a listen. And if you still have any doubt about the usefulness of AI for writers, definitely think of it as a co-pilot, a helpful tool that will help you create what you want to. The Probably the biggest issue I see with authors sort of categorically saying they would never use anything to do with AI, which, you know, can't be true. <laughs> because probably if you're listening to this, there is some kind of AI algorithm involved. Um, but an AI is not some distinct entity with a will of its own. It is not the Terminator deciding to make art or, or anything like that. It is a co-pilot. It's tool, a tool. So in the same way that I use this microphone and this recording and editing software and this internet <laughs> to reach you with my words, they are different to what other people are doing with exactly the same tools. So you will use AI tools differently depending on what you want to create and your voice and all of that. The human behind the experience is what matters. Like I said, I mean, you can pick up any MP3 from anyone or use the same software or the internet. I mean, come on, tools are used for all kinds of things. And to me, this is what these tools are. It's another way to do what we want to do. And uh, maybe sometime in the future, AI will have its own distinct will of its own, but it's certainly not now. And I really don't think it will be my lifetime. So as ever, I am not worried. I am excited about using these AI tools even more in 2023. So yes, have a listen to the Stark Reflections podcast. And of course, I have lots of back episodes on AI. Just go to thecreativepen.com forward slash future and you'll find links there or just have a scroll back through the feed. In my personal update, I have finished the narration for the audiobook of Pilgrimage and I wanted to share a useful tip for those of you who do self-narrate. You can now use Hindenburg Narrator for mastering your files. They have a one-click output for ACX and for Findaway Voices. Now, I've been narrating and editing my own audiobooks for years, but I've always had to pay someone to master. But now there is software. It is super useful. So that is Hindenburg Narrator and I'll put a link in the notes. 
Now, if you'd like to listen to a couple of chapters, then I have just released two chapters on my Books and Travel podcast feed. So you can find that if you search Books and Travel wherever you're listening to this. And of course, I know I said I was finishing the Books and Travel podcast, but that was the interview stuff. So um, I am occasionally going to still use the feed for interesting things around books and travel, but only my own stuff. So uh, this is a couple of chapters from my pilgrimage book in Books and Travel podcast. The chapters are on how walking in the path of history can put life in perspective and finding a glimpse of the divine in unexpected places. So you'll be able to get the audiobook as part of the Kickstarter delivered through BookFunnel in mid-February and it will also be out on all the usual audiobook sites later in the year. It will be available on the Kickstarter 23rd of January to the 5th of February and you can sign up to be notified at thecreativepen.com forward slash pilgrimage and if you're listening in the future that link will redirect to wherever the book is sold. So yes, if you fancy listening to me narrate, and of course my audiobook narration voice is different to my podcasting voice (laughs) because they're different products and you need different voice. So yes, and when I say different voice, you know, different tone, different feeling. The book has a very different feeling as well. So yes, head on over to my books and travel podcast for that. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments over the last few weeks. Um, I have had quite a lot, but I'm getting back into them. So uh, Henry Hyde shared a comment in response to episode 663 on quitting. Great discussion. I quit doing my Inside Your Head podcast despite loving the subject matter and having had wonderful guests. But like your podcast, your my books and travel that I've announced um that I'm stopping. It produced negative income for me, so it had to go, although I hope one day it might be possible to revisit the topic. Quitting helped me refocus on my real tribe, the people who consistently and reliably provide me with a proper income. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. And uh, I obviously talked about it in episode 663. Thank you, Henry. And talking of AI, on Twitter, Bernie Anderson says, just wanted to say a big thank you for introducing me to chat GPT. I'm having a blast playing with it, moving two different whips or work in progress forward. This is like jet fuel for writing. And thanks to Amra Prajalik, who sent a picture, a lovely picture, listening in the rain. She said, listening to the fearless writer while walking in the rain in Melbourne, Australia. Love the conversation about accepting imperfections and focusing on the creative journey rather than arbitrary measures of success. Thank you for another inspiring episode. So thank you, everyone. And remember, you can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N. Send me pictures of where you're listening. You can email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation. So this episode is sponsored by Ingram Spark, which I use to print and distribute my self-published print books wide. Because with Ingram Spark, it's my content, but they help me do more with it. If you publish through Ingram Spark, you will have access to over 40,000 retailers, independent bookstores, libraries, schools and universities, chain bookstores and more across a global network of distributors, including bookstores like Foils, Blackwells and Waterstones in the UK, as well as bookshop.org, which has become very popular since the pandemic, Booktopia in Australia and New Zealand, Chapters Indigo in Canada, Walmart, Target and loads of independent bookstores in the USA. Of course, it means your book will be available to order, but you will still have to drive demand. But since having my books on Ingram Spark, I've had many pictures of my print books in libraries and I've sold them at book fairs, conventions and in physical stores. And uh, basically, remember... The discount is how bookstores make a living, essentially, and they cannot do that with other retailers. So you can choose to use returns, but it's not necessary. You can choose your discount percentage. You can also bulk order. For example, if you want back of the room copies for live events or you work direct with schools or bookstores, uh, you just order them and get them shipped to the location. And this is super useful because they do have global plants. So, for example, I was speaking in Australia and got 
thing sent from the Ingram plants in Australia there. They have, um, I often ship boxes for bookstores in the USA direct from the US plant, that kind of thing. And of course, you can get my books in libraries and bookstores. Your local independent bookstore can order from the catalogue. So your book should be available if you publish through Ingram's Bark uh, at various bookstores, libraries, schools, universities. And if you want them there, you need to go wide. Now, remember, you can publish with Ingram as well as other services. So yeah, like any of the formats, you can use multiple services. I personally use Ingram alongside KDP Print and also Book Vault for my Shopify store. So don't limit yourself. Go wide with your print books. It's your content. Do more with it. Head on over to ingramspark.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show and my brain is sponsored by my wonderful patrons. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years and months. You're all amazing. And thanks to new patrons this week, Susan Plath and Liz Elwood. If you support the show on Patreon, you get my extra monthly Q&A for patrons only, which is about 45 minutes of extra audio where I answer questions about writing craft, publishing, book marketing and making a living with your writing. I also share discount codes, behind the scenes information, early access and more. You can support the show with just a few dollars or euros or pounds or whatever your currency is. And uh, yeah, I will be very appreciative. You can support the show at patreon.com, p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, let's get into the interview. Roz Morris is a best-selling author as a ghostwriter and an award-nominated author with her own literary novels. She writes writing craft books for authors under the Nail Your Novel brand and is also an editor, speaker and writing coach. Today, we're talking about why writers abandon books and how you can draft, fix and finish with confidence. And we'll have tips for both fiction and nonfiction authors. So welcome back to the show, Roz. Thank you, Joanna. It's so nice to be here again. (laughs) <laughs> and this is your sixth time on the show, <laughs> which is amazing. It's probably been like a decade now since you've been coming on the show. <laughs> yes, it has. And I was a listener from the early days. And when you contacted me and said, do come on my show, I thought, oh, that's brilliant because I've been listening for ages. So, yes. Oh, and yeah, over the years, we've become friends and we've both written lots of books and we've had a journey. But what's great is that you have so many books to help authors and you're very wise, which is why I like talking to you. But we're not going to get into your background because we've done it many times before. But let's get into the topic itself and start with a bit of an overview. So what are the most common reasons that writers abandon books? Like, why doesn't every author just finish every book? Well, we always start on a blaze of enthusiasm and inspiration. You you get terribly excited, can't wait to get to the keyboard, hammer loads of words down. And, And then we lose enthusiasm. And then what might happen is we grind on anyway, but for most people that's quite hard because they don't know how to do it and how to do it productively. Or we get interested in something else and start another book and off we go again. Or we run out of material or we don't have enough time to actually do justice to the book and and sort of make enough regular appointments with ourselves to write it because it does take a while to write a whole book. Um, Or we read something else and think, oh, someone else has done it better. What's the point? That's really why most books get abandoned. And I wondered, because I did this survey on the Creative Pen podcast last year, uh, well, this year as we're recording this, last year as this goes out, and it was kind of stunning to me that this was one of the most common questions. So I did just want to ask you, because you wrote this particular book about why writers abandon books and how to sort it out. So how did you know that this was one of the most common issues? Mainly from talking to writers, meeting them, and they would say, oh, well, how do you get to the end of a book? So they'd all been able to start. And then uh, it had just failed them in some way. But I'd got quite a lot of books under my belt by that time as a ghostwriter, because I, I used to do a lot of ghostwriting of fiction. So I realised I'd developed a method for doing all the work necessary to go from that big sort of big bang of inspiration to start with, and then finally end up with a book that was 
not only finished, but presentable. And I thought, um, I have obviously developed a system that gets me to the end and gets me through all the bad bits because there are bad bits. And I thought, well, I'll write a book about how I do that. And then it turned out that, uh, that quite a lot of people found it helpful. It is a very good book. And we're going to get into some of those things that you gave as an, an overview. But it's so interesting because you just mentioned there words like system and method <laughs> and process. And I mean, I'm a discovery writer, but also you do take a long time to to write your literary novels in particular, and they do meander in a lot of ways. And your process is very creative. So how can you both have a system and a method and a process, but also be very imaginative and sort of lean into creativity? Well, I have the process to help me do worthwhile things with the more creative ideas that I have. So the process will be ways of getting the work done, ways of getting myself back on track if I've got distracted, ways of allowing myself to go down new creative avenues if I think, oh, this book needs a bit more of this kind of excitement or I need to research something. The process gives me a kind of big framework that will get me, will allow me to control my creative urges and put them to good use. That probably sounds quite woolly. But I have ways in which I think, well, how am I going to use this? Where does it belong in the book? Does it belong in the book? Something I do is write lists of whether reasons to have something in the book or reasons not to have it in the book. Uh, so I, I think what my process does is it in, imposes discipline on the creativity aspect of it. So I'm very creative. I want to find the best way of using an idea. I want to find the most original way to use an idea. I want to find the deep meanings that I feel in are in an idea, which is why I take so long to write a book. But then what I also want to do is impose discipline on it so that the book is not just a sprawling mess of absolutely everything I've ever thought of. Um, it's got purpose and a clear vision and themes and story. And my process allows me to pull everything together so that I can be creative and also create a coherent work that will that other people can enjoy. Well, let's get into one of the things. I mean, you mentioned starting with the blaze of enthusiasm, which then grinds to a halt. And this word grinds, I think, is really interesting because, I mean, I feel like there's a bit of a myth that every moment of writing a book is just going to be amazing and we're in flow and it's like, wow, I'm just, all of this is amazing. <laughs> but it feels like maybe some people lose enthusiasm and they think, that's the end of it. But how does it feel when that first flush of romance, I guess, has gone from a book? And how do we approach that grind? That is so wise what you've just said there, that other people think they're doing it wrong if they're not inspired all the time. But most of writing is work. You know, it's like your diet is probably work as well. At first, you're thinking, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really get myself into the shape I want to. And I have this vision of what it will be like, and I will not be diverted from my course. And to begin with, a book is like that. And then there will be bits that aren't as easy as you thought they were going to be. And very soon, that's when it's sort of like work. So what I do is I have various ways to remind myself of the original burst of inspiration. So what I do now when I begin a book is I write myself notes that, that capture the particular things about the idea that gave me joy. And then I can look at them again later and think, oh, that is still giving me joy when I read it. How can I get back to that? Or do I want to revise it? But the joy is still there. You've captured it. It's really important to do that. Also, I build soundtracks that give me just feelings that I want to put into the book. And quite a lot of those are pieces of music that, that just make me think, my book could be this. And when I play them again, it starts that feeling again. And I also have other books that I collect or movies that I collect that are touchstones for the initial inspiration. So I think it's very important to keep things, you know, it's like mementos of the, the first moments of a romance. This is when it was a really good idea. So there's that. 
But then also, I think what you have to do is some actual work, which is which may not sound very creative, but it will get you to the end. There comes a point where you can't just sit there making things up. You need to know where you're going. And most of us, I find, can hold a beginning in our heads and just write from that and blaze onwards. But after a while, we kind of run out of impetus. We are inventing stuff and inventing stuff and inventive stuff. And then after a while, we realize it's not really going anywhere, is it? It's quite random. And unless you're very experienced, you won't then know what to do next. And that's usually the point where most writers think, oh, this isn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. The inspiration's deserted me or I can't do this. But what a lot of writers don't realise, especially when they start out, is that a satisfying story has actually got a lot going on under the words, under the moment by moment of each chapter. There's actually a pattern being built and expectations being built for the reader and seeds being planted and things brought in that will be much more important later. And all that is really almost impossible to do unless you've planned it. So if you make a plan, you will then know how to make the best use of all the ideas you've had, whether to immediately write a, a scene where something amazing happens or whether to keep it for much later, because actually it belongs later in the book. And if you start thinking in terms of making a plan of how the whole book will go, you are much more likely to make the best use of your inspirations and get all the way to the end. Mm. And as a discovery writer, I do find, like I write out of order anyway for both fiction and nonfiction, but there always comes a point where I just go, like, as you said, like, I uh, don't know what's happening here and I don't know where this is going. And like right now I have a short story and I, the ending, I still don't know the ending. <laughs> I've got like, and I've written an ending, but it's not the ending. So I'm on my third printout and reread, you know, and re-edit. And with my nonfiction, what I find is when I print things out and read them, and this normally happens to me in a full length book at around, let's say, 30,000 words. So I'll end up printing out what I have and only by sort of printing it out because I that's how I edit I kind of look at it from that higher level that structural viewpoint and then I can make a plan so even if people are listening and a plan can just be a few bullet points like it doesn't have to be a spreadsheet right (laughs) but I mean from reading your books I know you're you're both unstructured and structured in your planning but it's like you can do this plan later on in the process and it may be that for people who have blazed their first 20,000 words or 40,000 words that's when you can then take a look at it and make a plan now I always want to be the person who plans it just doesn't work for my creative process so I do it a bit differently but there always comes a point where you have to (laughs) figure out what the hell's happening with the book Yes, absolutely. And the planning can come at whatever stage suits you. Most writers develop their own process and everyone probably does the same elements, but probably at different points, depending on what suits them. I do give an example in Nail Your Novel, actually, of how I I wrote 60,000 words, having a really lovely time inventing stuff. And then I realized one day, I really, really don't know what I'm doing with this. I don't know where it's going. So I thought, okay, the the time is right to, to really think about everything. And it might be that that's what you need to do. Or it might be that you're better if you know what the last line is going to be. The children's writer, Alan Garner, does that. He um, does something like, he always says, a year of planning for every book, and then he gets the last line and he knows exactly where he's going with everything and has their, their own method. You kind of find what you need. But what you generally need to do is at some point to have a route map to follow, because then you'll make the best use of your ideas. And you'll also spot if you've got ideas you haven't used well enough. A very very common thing I find when I assess manuscripts is that there'll be threads that start and they don't have the consequences that they should have. And those consequences would make great story elements and would really spice things up and would get all the interest and complication that's at the moment missing from the book. So there's often a lot in the original inspiration and roughness that you can look at and then 
make much better use of. And the same goes for nonfiction as well, because in, in a nonfiction book, you might find you've glossed over some aspects of your subject and you could actually make them into whole sections by themselves and then the book would feel a lot more complete. It, it's the same kind of thing. It's seeing how to, to make the best out of the material you've got. And or also figuring out what else you need. So nonfiction, for example, it may be that you need to do well and fiction, too. You might need to do some research. Sometimes I feel that new authors in particular think that everything has to come out of their head for a novel or even for nonfiction. But like I'm <laughs> right now, as we record this, I have a pile of another like 15 books behind me that are research into the next novel idea that I have. And I, I mean, I read tons. In fact, for my pilgrimage book, I've probably read about 50 books over the last couple of years that kind of all go together and I've picked bits up and used quotes from some but just ideas that have popped into my head for others so what are your thoughts on when we might need to research in order to continue that is such a good point and I love the fact that you've raised the point of your pilgrimage book which you are writing from your own experience and you might think that all you would need is your own experience but that's just not so every every book that, that you write, you usually need to check facts, check any assertions you make, find out what other people have done. I found when I wrote my travel memoir, Not Quite Lost, I, I was having to go and look things up and check that I hadn't made um, any dumb assumptions. It would have been fine to make those assumptions in my diary when I was writing the actual incidents that go in the book. But when you put it in print and it's going to be for an actual book for other people to read, you've usually got to do a lot of checking and additional research. And yeah, so you need research in absolutely every kind of book you write, whether fiction or non-fiction. And something that I find particularly with fiction is because we're often writing about things we haven't done or we don't have personal experience of, we, we might think, oh, I don't know, I don't really know what it's like to work in the circus in the 1930s. Does that mean I can't write the book? Well, no, you just stop and go and do some research about it. Research stops are a totally legitimate part of the work of writing a book. And you can, depending on what works for you, you can either just stop there and then and go and do that research and gather lots of stuff and then bring it back to the book and decide where you're going to use it. Or if not very much depends on those particular details, what you could do if you want to keep the flow and you've got a good flow going and you, or you want to get a word count done every day is you could just carry on writing and put placeholder words for those details you will then look up later and then go and look them up. But research goes on all the time, really. Mm, absolutely. Well, let's pick another kind of category. And I actually got one of the comments from the survey was from a listener called David, who said, I have at least three books on the go at the moment, or actually make that five. <laughs> and my problem is they're all totally different. And I just can't decide or find the inspiration on how to finish any of them. And th this comes under the category of the author who starts a project only to jump to another more exciting one and, and then jumps onto another one after that, or in fact, might just change their mind about what the project is anyway. And so how does the author who's started lots of projects commit to one and finish one? Because of course, you can have 20 manuscripts on your drive or sort of bits and bobs, but that's not the work, is it, in terms of getting things out into the world? Yes, but what a wonderful grasshopper imagination he has. <laughs> and, yes, you have got to decide to commit to something in order to be able to do enough preparation on it to then feel like you've got the, the serious chops to write it. What I would do if I was David is I would pick one of those projects to spend a month on. You've got to give something like this time. Otherwise, you'll sort of decide to just put it down when the going gets a bit tough. And all books do get tough at some stage. But keep in mind that when you've gone a bit further with them, they then become intensely rewarding because you have taken nothing, just something from your brain, and you have made a book out of it. And that's one of the things that really makes it very rewarding. But So what I would do, if I was David is I pick one of those projects and just concentrate on that. And if it's a novel, decide 
what whether you've got all the the elements of the most interesting setting for the idea the most interesting use of the idea the kinds of characters you'd have all the, those basic building blocks find out if there's any research you can do which and as soon as you start doing research that really does heap new ideas into your mind you'll get absolutely loads of material and then i would start to make a very rough plan of where the book could go because obviously what he's lacking is a route map for where to take it. And none of this has to destroy the creativity. I think this is a feeling that I've detected from talking to quite a lot of authors. They don't really want to spoil the spontaneity because the spontaneity and the creativity is the joy. But if you do these other tasks, they are also creative. They are helping you gather material that you will then put into the book and you will you won't just take a piece of research and put it in verbatim you will make something out of it you will decide my characters could do this or this could create a really interesting plot situation or a really interesting dilemma always look for dilemmas by the way dilemmas are absolutely brilliant they are drama but if your reader is wondering what your characters are going to do and what they would do if they were in such a difficult situation that is going to keep them gripped so you can gather all this material and then you'll find by doing that kind of work on the idea you've got a lot more that you can have it that you've got at your disposal to then start making a short synopsis or some bullet points or a more detailed synopsis and then you'll be able to write and keep writing and it's interesting I think this idea of committing to a book I mean I have something similar in that I have a sort of drive where I have bigger book ideas under a structure and then what I do is I number them and I move them up and down the hierarchy depending on which ones I'm being drawn to and then by the time I'm ready to write this like this short story that I'm writing it's a a kind of a military photographer idea spun from a, a memoir that I read years ago and I've been thinking about it since I had this eye operation since I had my laser eye surgery done and this is kind of noodled around in my brain for years so it, I guess it comes under that thing where I had an idea and now I'm like okay it's risen to the top of my tree and now I'm actually going to write it and that means to me once I commit, I actually have to finish the project. And so it's like I have these other books that I'm kind of flirting with. (laughs) And then once I'm actually committed, then I will finish that. Like this pilgrimage book, maybe like you're not quite lost. This is years in the making. And we can commit to a book that will that might take a long time. But once we commit, it's like now we're going to finish it, right? Absolutely. Yes. And you also find that it develops far more reality for you because you're taking it seriously you're spending time with it you are grappling with problems on it all that makes it a bigger and more solid thing and there are times when it it will seem quite difficult but what i've often found is that's usually some little reminder in my brain saying you haven't yet sorted out this problem so you can then do some sort of self-diagnosis and think what exactly is bothering me about this and then you go and solve the problem for instance I remember with my most recent novel Everest I was thinking oh this is I don't like this aspect of it okay why don't I like that aspect once you have diagnosed a problem once you've asked yourself why enough times you can then solve that and the rest of the book is perfectly fine it's just a particular part of it was sort of a bit blocked and holding you up. So that will keep you committed as well. And as as we've said, once you have quite a lot of work that, that you've done on the book, it's got a solidity of its own. And it's not just a little thing that you started as a bit of a craze and then drop. It's got quite a substantial mass in your computer, in your head, in the amount of time you spent with it, in the things you think about when you go out for a walk, you'll find you're taking the book with you. So if you put the work in, it is rewarded. The book becomes big enough for you to write. So what about those people? I mean, and this often happens with people's first books, but can often happen later, which is they started a project, but because they have so little time to write, it's stretching on forever. And like we both know people who've spent sort of a decade writing a book and there really will come a point where maybe you can't remember what the hell, you know, why did you start it in the first place? And you kind of think, oh, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore or just and the amount of time 
that's been allocated to this book sort of doesn't really allow it to finish. So how do people get over that? Well, you do have to decide you're going to commit regular time to it and enough regular spots that you will be able to keep it all in your head and know where you're going with it. Now, it might only be 20 minutes a day or 20 minutes, five days a week or something. But what you need is some continuity so that it becomes something you can pick up. And a lot of writing is is done by thinking is when you're away from the computer, you start wondering about things, the little detail you can just dwell on for a while when you haven't got the pressure of the page in front of you. That's all really valuable time. So if you do manage to set aside only 20 minutes to do the actual writing, you'll find you are doing more. And so you will get far more out of just that that 20 minutes. So try if possible to commit enough regular sessions that you can make progress. And another thing you can do is write yourself continuation notes. If you might have to put the book down for a few days and you know you won't be firing on all cylinders when you get back, write yourself a couple of bullet points, in maybe in the text, about what you're going to do next. And that means when you then open the file again, you don't have a blank mind. You've still actually got some idea of what you're going to do next. And what you could do is, I, earlier I mentioned things like triggers that help you keep sight of your original inspiration, the thing that originally made you really excited. You could use those as well. Go back to yeah. those or put them in the text file. Yeah, I think, and I guess there's two things we're saying here. And one is, if you need to be gentle with yourself, and I know there's people who cannot commit daily, that just doesn't work for their brain or perhaps their you know, kids or illness or whatever it is. For those people, I think the continuation notes are brilliant. And for those who can take the tough love... <laughs> I would say just you have to put it in your diary. You have to get up early or work late or whatever it is to get it done. Whichever way of motivation works for you, it is worth it to write your book. We're both telling you that the listener, it is worth it to take whatever is in your head and put it into the world. Like both of us feel there are just intrinsic benefits <laughs> to finishing a book. You will be so proud of yourself, regardless if it's your first book or your 30th or 50th or whatever book, you'll be like, yes, look what I've just done. This is amazing. So yeah, I mean, it's either be gentle with yourself or tough love, right, Roz? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think it is. And, you know, there is toughness in everything you try to do, even if you started out doing it just because you felt like it. And I certainly found that when I was writing my ghostwritten novels, that there'd be times I'd think, oh, I really don't feel like it today. But I had a deadline, had to get it done. It's supposed to be creative work, but you still do have to make something out of nothing sometimes. And what I found was if I just sat down, I'd put some music on the headphones and think, right, one CD and I'll see how I feel. Um, the days of CDs. I was going to say you're aging yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would I'd get into it 10 minutes, I'd be fine. So there are ways that you can overcome the kind of initial re reluctance. If, if you are just feeling a bit reluctant to start, there are ways of overcoming that too. But yes, there are also life circumstances that make it more difficult. And now we have so many ways of recording our words, even if we can't type. We can, you can just say it into a, a dictaphone. Again, if you've made a plan, it will be a lot easier for you to use, to, to make useful words out of that, out of that time. So if you've got a plan and you're thinking, right, I need this to happen and this to happen, and this to happen, you can speak it into a dictaphone and you'll get some text that's more usable than if you were just trying to randomly pick up for 20 minutes and didn't really know where you were going. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And uh, again, nowadays, it's more like an app than, than a dictaphone. But I mean, I, I'm now using it's good enough. And in fact, this transcript will be generated using otter.ai. And I've got, I use the otter app now on my phone. And AI transcription is great. Uh, in a lot of situations now, especially if it's just one voice. So that tip is really good. I mean, I know I remember when I was really sick with COVID and I just literally was lying in bed a lot and being able to speak and listen was a really good way of creating and also learning and thinking. And in fact, I think that's um, 
you're not I think we spoke about not quite lost soon after that and partly you're not quite lost was part of my inspiration for my pilgrimage book so I feel like there's lots of things that go into the making of a book but we have to commit time like there's literally no way around it (laughs) you have to put time in (laughs) Yes, but it is a lot easier than it used to be where if all you had was a computer to type on. Now there are, I'm not used to calling them apps yet because <laughs> <laughs> I do everything on a desktop. I have only just acquired a phone that can do things like apps and it's all very new. Oh, you're but- hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let that be encouraging to everyone listening. You do not have to be as techie as me to make a career of this. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Well, let's talk about confidence because this is another thing is that you mentioned this in the overview is like you're writing this book and then you realize that someone else has written a book like this or, you know, Colleen Hoover's hit the top of the charts with a book just like your idea or someone has written a nonfiction book that is this, like similar to yours. So how do we get past the point of going like, what's the point? That is such a good question and will seem to have had your idea, but your idea is yours. It's not theirs. You will do it differently. Uh, And the the first thing you should do is to look very closely at all the other versions. And there'll be quite a lot more versions of what seem to be similar to your idea. Read them all. And they are part of your research. What you'll find is very soon you'll think, oh, I wouldn't have done that with it anyway. And that will make you more clear about what you do want to do. And if you do find that somebody has done something very close, um, you probably should think of a way to make yours different. But it doesn't mean that your your idea is wasted, that there are some people say oh, there are only a few stories in the whole world. And maybe there are if you group them together. But there are so many author voices and author souls and styles and ways of examining the human condition or writing how-to books or writing a memoir, the personal touch is what will make yours different. But if you do find this something else that's quite like what you plan to do, bite the bullet, go and read it, and and then sort of have a think about, have a kind of dialogue with it. What is different about yours? How you could make yours even more different? What it might make you think is, oh, well, their version is perhaps a little wider ranging or deeper than I was going to go. So what could I do with my idea to to make it more mine? It is always going to happen, but you should use it as an opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting, this question, because I was just reflecting as you were talking. I mean, your books on writing novels, for example, you've got lots of them now and they're all amazing. And when I was thinking about, oh, do you know what? I really should write a book on writing a novel because people keep asking me for it. But there are so many. I mean, you've obviously written some of them, but there are so many books on writing novels. And I spent a lot of time going there's no point in me writing one because I can just refer people to your books, for example, or to Stephen King (laughs) or James Patterson's masterclass or whatever. And so my confidence around how to write a novel, my book, I had a draft for years, but I couldn't get it out there until I actually rewrote my first three novels and I realized that I'd learned a lot and maybe I could share it now. And so the confidence to write that particular book took time, but I didn't just sit there during those years not writing anything else. So what do you think about the sort of there's there are books that will take time, so maybe they just need to be put into the future and in the meantime we work on something else? Like how would you know when an idea is is ready? Do you know what I mean? Too, and that's such a good question. Yes, some books we'll need to mature a bit more in order to be able to write them. Quite mm. simply, we need to get more experience to put our own our own personal spin on it. As you've explained there, maybe five years ago, wouldn't have been the right time for you to release that book. But now you've got some, you've got quite a lot more of your own experience to to add value to it. So, so yes, what you might do is is finish a draft and think it's it's sort of all right, but it's not satisfying me yet. So it's, you have to go a lot on gut feeling. And that's something that you learn as a writer. No one can teach you gut feeling. Gut feeling just sort of comes with experience, with lots of reading as well as writing. Writers should always read, read loads and loads of stuff, get to know what else is out there. 
where your book fits. And then you have a, a better sense of whether you are contributing something useful to the books of that kind that, that readers of those kinds of books will appreciate. So yes, you might finish something to the best of your ability at the time, but you might still think it, it needs to settle a bit or I need to settle a bit and then come back to it. And in the meantime, maybe write something simpler. Like I have quite a few of these books, like the, my shadow book, which, you know, I've been talking about for probably a decade. And then also like I want to write something similar to Stephen King's The Stand, which is my favorite book. And it is an epic dark fantasy book and like a thousand or fifteen hundred pages or something. And it's so big that it kind of it scares me that project scares me but yeah I want to put something like that in my life at some point so that would be another tip to people listening like if there's a well let's get into this question of quitting because I feel like there's a difference between quitting a project because of some of the reasons we've talked around about and not finishing it and then parking a project because maybe you're not ready or you want to tackle it when you've got more life experience or more writing experience. And there's this sort of, you must finish what you start, one of Heinlein's rules, but then this book Quit by Annie Duke that I've talked about on the show and lots of people have, and which is about walking away and really just leaving something behind. So I guess that's a continuum, but how do you know when we should park something? How do we know when we should finish something? Parking is such a good word for this. I always believe in parking rather than giving up. because <laughs> that, mm. that is because I think a lot of the writing mindset requires you to just go through some of the, the grueling days and just get on with it. And there are always little problems that you need to solve in a manuscript where really bum on the seat is the only way. Uh, so giving up is, is, is quite hard for anyone to do. I do think that you can... You, you can find you need to just put a book down for a bit and go on to something else. And you usually find that if you're the kind of person who's had an idea for one book, you'll have ideas for more because it's more that you have just the writing urge, the creativity urge, the need to make other people see why something that's, that strikes you can also be very exciting to them and the need to communicate all that. that that's just a really basic thing thing that artistic people have. And that's why if you start one kind of book, you'll probably start another kind of book. So you might have several that are done to the best of your ability at the time, but that you could revisit when you've got fresh insight, something else that you could add, some, something you could use to add what you think is missing. It is gut feeling again, if it seems it's not quite satisfying to you yet. That's a, an indication that you should park the book for a while. And the feeling that something is not quite satisfying is also what we'll see through revisions. We all have to revise our manuscripts. They don't come out perfect first time, even with all the planning in the world, because they're so big, there's so much complexity. And when we revise, some of it's by a plan and some of it's by the gut feeling that this could be better, this doesn't quite work, or, oh, that does work. So listen to your gut a lot. It's hard, though, because we're like, oh, you can park a book, but you have to finish some books, and you can't just keep parking everything. <laughs> so it's funny, but... I don't know, you kind of get to know this through experience. And sometimes you have to force yourself onwards and you'll figure out how to finish a book. Or sometimes you do need to park it. And it is hard to juggle, isn't it? But I, I guess, how do you measure? Because some of your books have taken years to write. So I guess, how do you know that this is the book you are going to finish this time? And why is it worth it for you to keep going even after decades as an author? Oh, good question. Yes, my last novel took about seven years and it came from a short story idea I wrote actually about 30 years ago now. <laughs> so <laughs> it took me a very long time to be able to start envisaging it as a much bigger story, but I always had the feeling something was in there. And as I, I keep saying that everything starts with a feeling of, you know, a feeling, I must write this. And that sort of, if, if the book is going to become a book in, in the end, it will always keep 
tweaking at you. It's this idea that there is something in there that I really want to explore and express. That's with, with my kind of novels because they're quite literary, although they are very story based. Because I, I love a good story, but I also want to, I, I want something else bigger to shimmer through. And finding that is very rewarding to me. And creating characters who are complex and in unique difficulties really interests me. And I slowly find that a novel kind of builds itself around me. The ideas for the characters start to become quite real. So it develops its own momentum and it becomes a thing I find very rewarding to build and problem solve. That's a sort of very personal reason for wanting to write, but it's the personal reward of creating something and doing it as well as you can. And I often will find that I, I might be reading something else or watching a movie and I'll think, oh, that was a note that I really wanted to put in the book, but I hadn't yet thought of it. The After you've had a book sort of with you for a while, it ambushes you for all the time from unexpected directions. And that's very rewarding too. But that's the kind of real long haul book. I've written other sorts of books. In, while I was writing Ever rest. I, I wrote Not Quite Lost, which was just from travel diaries. And that was a hoot to do that, even though it, <laughs> there was some hard work in, the, in that, as you would have found with your pilgrimage book. You, know, you have to do certain bits of research, have to sort of rewrite things so that they are intelligible to an audience who isn't you because you originally wrote it as diaries which is just for yeah. you um, and and I also wrote some of my nail your novel books as well and they were all rewarding in their own way the nail your novel books I thought right I really want to communicate how you can do this how you can solve this problem how you can make your books much better and in terms of you know the widest number of people can understand so that's really rewarding as well I think the reward really underneath it all is communication, isn't it? It's mm. making, giving somebody either an escapist experience or a mysterious or thrilling experience or a useful experience or an inspiring experience that helps them go and do something they wanted to do. Yes, basically, we just love doing this and we can't help ourselves. <laughs> That's it. We can't help ourselves. Yes. <laughs> we can't stop. <laughs> but we did all both of us had to figure out to start with how we were going to take that urge and get something out at the other end that would be satisfying to us indeed so just tell us a bit more about your books for authors and how the others in the series might also help people well, the original book that started all this for me was called Nail Your Novel, Why Writers Abandon Books and How You Can Draft, Fix and Finish with Confidence. And that's a process book. It'll do for any kind of novel. But it's also quite good for nonfiction as well, because it's about structuring your idea, filling gaps, um, finding ways to solve the problems, what kind of problems you'll get, how to keep sitting there and writing every day or every 20 minutes every other day if that's what you can manage and then also how to edit without getting lost without getting stuck in endless rounds of editing and editing and editing and never finishing it and um, how to present it to the world when you have got a manuscript you're satisfied with so that's all in that nail your novel book it's a process book follow the steps you'll get to the end of your book I've also made a workbook version of that with a few extra tips and exercises to, to help you do that. And the other books in the series are one on characters and one on plot. And they were distilled from the work I've done with other authors working on their manuscripts, figuring out the common misconceptions they have, how they can do what they want to do, what goes wrong. Lots of examples of how to, for instance, create a character who people will like but won't find saccharine, how to write dialogue, how to write plots that have all the rises and falls in the right place, what those right places are, how to keep a reader curious. All those are in my characters book and my plot book. Brilliant. And they're, they're all excellent. I'll also, um, as I said, I really like Not Quite Lost. I think it's a quirky travel memoir. And also Everest. I've read, I think I've read all your novels as Ros Morris and Everest is fantastic. So I definitely recommend that as well to people listening. So where can people find you and your books online? Easiest place is probably my website, which is 
rosmorris.org and the ros is r-o-z and then it's m-o-r-r-i-s brilliant well thanks as ever for your time ros that was great thank you (laughs) so i hope you enjoyed the discussion with ros and if you want to finish your book this year perhaps it's given you some ideas for the way forward So next week, I'm talking to Becca Syme about trusting your intuition for writing as well as book marketing. It is a great discussion, so I look forward to sharing it with you. And remember, if you'd like to hear me narrate a couple of chapters of my pilgrimage book, head on over to the Books and Travel podcast for a listen. Or if you'd like to listen to me narrate your author business plan, which is on Spotify, you can get a promo code to get it for free if you email me, joanna at thecreativepen.com before the end of January 2023. And also Map of Shadows, the first in my Matt Walker dark fantasy trilogy, is also available as a promotion. So um, yeah, if you fancy that, that's not narrated by me, that is narrated by a professional fiction narrator. (laughs) So yes, email me. And in the meantime, happy writing, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.